Welcome to another edition of Science Behind the Coronavirus. In this fourth installment of the series, we're looking at a very important issue today that's affecting all of us. The viral variants that are circulating worldwide and the efforts to protect against them. So now I'm pleased to have Professor Shabir Madi join me from Johannesburg. Uh, Professor, welcome and thank you for taking the time to join us. Now, Shabir, that's when I heard your statement on Sunday that 50% of these patients were seropositive before, that in fact, and this is what really scared me, when you use, use the word immune pressure, that in fact it was the basis of the fact that people had antibodies because they were infected, and therefore the virus was continuing to mutate around it because the na na native infection or natural infection actually in itself is an immune suppressor, so there may be some uh, viruses continuing to grow. Now I'm going to take you through a logic gate that is torturing me. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to sort of see how we solve this, hopefully together in South Africa. And so logic gate that's torturing me as follows. If we know that every time you have an antibody in your body, whether it be from a natural infection or from a vaccine, it provides the virus an opportunity to mutate. It actually provides the fundamental seed for the virus to mutate because that's immune pressure or what you call antigenic drift. One way to stop that is to have a vaccine that prevents its replication. So it can grow and therefore, can't, you don't, and therefore the end point is infection mild to moderate infection rather than just inhibition of severe disease. So, I'm taking you through the logic gate now. If we know all these facts that in the presence of an antibody, we create the seed for the virus to mutate, and then we create another antibody which creates that mutation to remutate because there's thousands of opportunities for it to mutate. Is it therefore not logical that we should be looking at a whole different strategy, not just to say the bar is prevent severe disease, which is really important by the way. What we're doing is exactly right, I exactly just said we should be doing that, but looking at today's new science where the bar is to prevent them from replicating in the first place so they do not have this opportunity to use these antibodies against to which to mutate. I want to throw that out to you because it's a very deep subject that's been torturing me from the day this pandemic uh, occurred. In one year, literally, literally, I'm sitting here today, one year ago, we said the strategy must be to eradicate this virus Obviously, the holy grail is to get what we call sterile immunity. But if we can get there, we need to actually have a system of the entire immune system to eradicate it quickly before it uses the body to mutate and generate what we now think, sadly, will be an endemic beyond a pandemic. So I want you to react to that, Shavir, because I need the scientists who are actually at ground level I see this as Vietnam or the war, and you guys are at the front lines, uh, seeing this in real time every day. Um, maybe if you don't mind reacting to this logic gate, or I put it an illogic gate of the strategy that we are taking as a world. Sure. So I think you're absolutely correct uh, in that the ideal and the ideal vaccine that we require is one which has got neutralizing activity against the virus, uh, but at the same time induces a broad enough repertoire of immune response, uh, which won't always be susceptible uh, to uh, the virus mutating. Uh, so in addition to the antibody that's been induced and also the antibody itself, it, it might be that we're able to direct the antibody against a part of the stalk protein, as an example, which is relatively conserved, somewhat hidden from the immune system, uh, but at the same time allows for the antibody to work when uh, the person is initially infected. And as an example with uh, influenza vaccines, uh, what one of the things that has been considered is what is known as a stalk protein, 
or stem of the hemagglutinin, which is a part of that same part which is usually uh, used to design a vaccine, but is somewhat hidden and uh, much more stable. But in addition to that, what we want vaccines also to do is to induce what is known as T lymphocyte immunity. Uh, and then again, those, there's a much broader repertoire of uh, immune responses targeted at different components of be it the spike protein or one of the other proteins that are much more conserved in the virus. Uh, and that is the type of vaccine that we're wanting. The first generation of vaccines that we've got at hand are somewhat probably uh, what I would call crude vaccines in that it targets a very visible component of the virus and consequently it lends itself to these sort of mutations taking place. But it's obviously a start uh, and I think it's been a glorious start in terms of the initial success. But I think what's been unmasked now with the evolution of these uh, variants that have become resistant to some of this vaccine-induced antibody is that that is not the only route to go and we need to look at a much more broader repertoire of vaccine-induced immune responses uh, to the virus itself. Another statement you made, which really disturbed me, was you said not only is this mutation more infective, but they were more virulent. Could you um, give us a little more color on that statement that you made? Uh, so this is some data that has come out from the United Kingdom, uh, where they basically did analysis. And uh, although there's some sort of uh, uncertainty in terms of the exact increased virulence of the variant that's circulating in the United Kingdom, which shares one characteristic similar to the South African variant, or the variant that started off uh, in South Africa. The variant in the United Kingdom, which is known as the B117 variant, uh, in fact, it's less worrisome in that it doesn't contain this, it doesn't include these critical mutations, at least until recently, which would cause it to be evasive to the immunity that's induced by past infection or vaccine-induced immunity. But this mutation that did take place increases the affinity of the virus to be able to infect humans. Uh, and uh, some of the initial uh, indications uh, recently released from the United Kingdom uh, suggest that that particular variant in the United Kingdom might have increased uh, its virulence by anything between 30 to 50 percent uh, compared to the original virus. So people developing more severe disease and more likely to die, especially obviously if they've got underlying uh, risk factors for severe disease. So there is some uh, uncertainty in terms of the exact magnitude of the increase of the virulence of the virus in the United Kingdom. Uh, in South Africa, where we've got less robust surveillance systems, uh, it's been difficult to untangle as to whether the variant circulating in South Africa is also more virulent than the original virus that was circulating. Uh, there's certainly been an increase in terms of the number of people that have been infected, as well as the number of deaths that have taken place during the course of the resurgence. But I think that's more a function of the increased transmissibility of the virus rather than virus uh, being more virulent uh, in that causing more severe disease in any one individual. Uh, but so when looking at individuals that are hospitalized in South Africa, as an example, when looking at what percentage of them would go on to die, that number in South Africa has remained fairly stable unlike in the United Kingdom, where the data suggests otherwise. Shabir, talk, talk to me a little bit about what, what's your plans and how, what's your plans to do this expansion? Uh, so I think uh, in the immediate future, what we require is a recalibration of our expectations of this first generation of COVID-19 vaccines. I think they still got an extremely important role to play in terms of protecting individuals from developing severe disease. Uh, but this first generation of COVID-19 vaccines are not the vaccines that are going to get us to the so-called herd immunity threshold. Uh, if there's any vaccine that's ever going to get us to that threshold, I'm not too sure. Uh, but we really require to basically look at alternative approaches to vaccine, which goes beyond just looking at a spike protein as the target, which is what, except for the inactivated uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, all of the other current generation of COVID-19 vaccines are only focused on the spike protein of the virus, at least those that have been currently authorized for use. So I think what this experience teaches us is that we really need to look beyond the spike protein, look at other components of the virus to which if we induce an immune response, it would be assist in terms of either uh, facilitate expediting the destruction of the virus once a person is infected, or at least neutralize its activity. And I think that's where the focus needs to shift, at least for the next generation of COVID-19 vaccines. So there's, there's the issue of the implementation uh, and the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, and then there's the issue of getting 
vaccines that are designed differently uh, that hopefully will be more successful and less vulnerable to these sort of mutations that uh, seem to arise when we're only targeting one specific component of the virus, which in this instance has been the spike protein.